from the late 90s and early 2000s. So if you're ready, creeps, fasten your drool cups and hold on to your vomit bags. We're going to the movies. Frights, action. It should be frights, camera action. I'm sorry. I was laughing so hard as I was typing this because when I was watching the screen, I was like, we got to put this in the grip. My bad. Let me do it. Frights, camera, action. This week, we are continuing our spooky season with the 1995 film Tales from the Crypt, Demon Night, with our guest and TikTok mutual, Anwar Ali. Welcome, Anwar. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> Very excited. If you haven't listened to our trailer episode, press pause, go check it out, listen to that episode and come back. But before we dive in, let's get into some housekeeping. If you love the podcast and you want to support us, here's a few ways you can. Did you know writing a review and or rating us helps us get more listeners? If you want to be featured and help us grow, head to Apple, Spotify, Podchasers, Good Pods, or your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. And if you like what you hear and want to buy us a virtual cup of coffee, because what we're up late working on stuff, <laughs> head over to ko-fi.com slash no more late fees. And don't forget, you can buy a coffee mug to celebrate with us after you buy us a coffee on our merch store at Redbubble. That's no more late fees .redbubble.com. So let's get into Tales from the Crypt Team and Night. Ex-soldier Frank Breaker is the guardian of an ancient key that can unlock tremendous evil. The sinister collector is a demon who wants the key so he can initiate the apocalypse. On the run from wicked mercenaries for almost 90 years, Breaker finally stops in at a boarding house in New Mexico, where, with the help of its residents, he plans to face off against the collector and his band of ghouls, preventing them from ever seizing the key. It stars Billy Zane, William Sadler, Jada Pinkett Smith, Brenda Bake, CCH Pounder, and Thomas Hayden Church. It was directed by Ernest Dickerson, Written by Mark Bishop, Ethan Reif, and Cyrus Forrest. And you can currently watch it on Peacock. But before we start, let's get into our ratings rewind. So you know the drill. Before we get into the movie, we'll reveal the rating our Y2K versions of ourselves will give. Then at the end, we'll see if our current selves agree with our initial rating. Our scale consists of would buy it, would buy it again. The best would play on repeat. Five-day rental. Would watch again. Two-day rental. Okay, but nothing to write home about. Same-day rental. Trash. Straight-up demon slime. Yep. All right, so I'm more, I'm going to start with you. What was your Y2K rating of this movie? So it's, I would, I would, I would buy it. <laughs> 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 because I, because I did buy it. <laughs> Jackie? I have actually never seen this movie. And you're not alone, kid, because I didn't either. <laughs> I love that we have a category that's don't remember because of me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm infamous for not remembering most of the time. But yeah, there was a part in the movie that I was like, this does feel familiar. So I don't know if it was like on the background and I was like falling asleep. But I do not like horror movies mainly because I'm chicken shit and I get scary all the time. But boy, oh boy, was this a ride? <laughs> was this a ride? And I, I have no explanation as to why <laughs> I haven't seen it because like legit Saturday nights, my family would come together as a family to watch Tales from the Crypt on HBO. It was bizarre reflecting on that, that that's what we chose to watch as a family. <laughs> but... I mean, I can tell you my favorite episode of the show, but for some reason, we never watched the movie. <laughs> well, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm going to box office and you're not alone. <laughs> this movie had a $12 million budget and it made $21.1 .1 So not bad. 
more than I thought. I mean, but it, when I when I paused it, it had like a thirty six percent on the rotten meter. I'm like, it beat raise your voice. Like it was so bad. I love that it was purposely released on Friday the thirteenth. Mm-hmm. Um, I think most of like the tales from the crypt stuff they tried to release it around that time or Halloween. That was like the whole thought process about if they because I know they wanted to release who this was supposed to be like a trilogy Mm -hmm. and it didn't get there now i'm looking at the box office i don't know why because the show show ran for seven seasons the second film came out in 1996 bordello of blood and Mm -hmm. that did about five million Mm -hmm. like five six million It, it was a failure and the thing is this movie demon knight was supposed to come out in 1994 it was supposed to come out halloween but then it got pushed back because they had to reshoot the ending. Mm. And so it got pushed back to Friday the 13th, 1995. It came out, did well, obviously did well enough for a little blood to go into production. It was supposed to come out, I think, in October of 1996. But Universal didn't have any films for the summer, like August set. So they put it out in August. It did terribly. My sister saw it in theaters, though. For a little blood. <laughs> <laughs> she did. So why don't you tell us a little bit about why you picked this movie and why you love it so much? It it seems very near and dear to your heart. So I just want to make sure that uh, that comes across. You know, I think from what I, so I have an interesting story of how I saw it the first time. And also, I think it's a really important film in the history of Black horror. And we just kind of don't talk about it enough. Yeah, They do talk about it in like, Car Noir, the documentary on Shudder, but they don't, it's just a lot of people don't know about it. They're discovering it over time because the 90s was weird for horror. But the first time I saw the movie, you remember when you would have to call on the phone to rent pay-per-view movies Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then you would turn it to the channel and then the movie would pop up. Um, My mom told my sister, because my mom wanted to see this movie when it came out to theaters, I remember seeing commercials and stuff for it. And my mom said, I want to see this. So she said to my sister, call the number and rent that movie for me at three o'clock. It was a Saturday. And so my sister did. And then my mom had to go and take my dad somewhere. (laughs) So I turned it over to (laughs) pay-per-view, the channel, and the movie popped up. And I sat and I watched the whole thing. And they had me hooked from the Universal logo and then automatically going to like the Tales from the Crypt, Mm -hmm. like opening. Yeah. Because I I was obsessed with Tales from the Crypt. I had a Crypt Keeper doll. It was a talking (laughs) Crypt Keeper doll. I had that. I used to love that show. I was young watching that Mm -hmm. show and it was obsessed with it. And so of course I wanted to see big screen movie. (laughs) And And I sat and I watched it and some of the, key things that stuck like I saw it that day and then I didn't see it again for a few years when it premiered on the sci-fi channel but I remember CCH Pounder's arm getting ripped off I remember seeing two black women I was like that's Mm -hmm. different like this there's two black women and I remember thinking while watching the film this group of people is so weird in a movie <laughs> together. I, I'm like, they're diver- it's diver- this is true diversity. You know right. I mean? This is a film that had people of different races, ages, body shapes. Yeah. It was the most, like, it's one of the, it's probably the most diverse horror film ever. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I remember just, there was some sort of, like, something opened in me. And I used to reenact the movie. I had, like, like my sister's dolls and so I used to reenact the movie and I just remember like this movie always just stuck in my head and I didn't know that at the time I didn't realize at the time that I guess because Jada Pinkett really hadn't got to her level yet. yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah so I went back to it and I was told you know Jada's in this movie right and I was like I saw that movie I didn't realize that was Jada and so I went back <laughs> and I was like uh, Jada is Jada is like the only black woman in a horror movie to save the entire world. This yeah. is a big deal. Why yeah. do we not talk about this? <laughs> I I I feel like sh- Jada and then is it Nimbush from Nimbush? Yeah, yeah, from Blade. People don't talk about her. The mm-hmm. fact that like she kicked ass. She didn't have powers. She was a hundred percent. I felt like she was a black woman just Mm -hmm. fixing problems getting stuff done 
and <laughs> let no me look one, at this blood yeah like <laughs> I'm gonna she, figure this out. she wasn't gonna wait for blade to come save her she was gonna take care of business and to the point they were they were almost equal partners in the way that they were going mm-hmm. after what they needed to get done at the end I, yeah. I I just feel like those characters like Jada they're not talked about enough mm-hmm. and kind of glossed over I was really sad that we didn't get her in another blade too and yeah. really sad that we don't see Jada in more horror films yeah 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 and she doesn't really talk about being in this movie much she just never it just I, at first of all I think people don't ask her about it but I don't think she realizes the impact of it because no one ever talks about it for her to realize like what she really accomplished with this film and for it to be a major studio relatively big budget at the time for something like this film yeah. to, for them to be like okay cool you know we're gonna make this movie and we're gonna do it and it's gonna go out to theaters and we're not gonna market it as some sort of niche film we're gonna market it as a horror film that's coming out yeah. <laughs> and it was yeah. a yeah it was the definitely this movie is it felt so 90s I, I couldn't even I, I, I was I felt like I was in my 90s self watching it because it brought me back so much to that time period. And then to see one of the other things is like, obviously we had Jada, but like the cast was stacked in this movie. Almost every single person in this movie was recognizable and had a very good career afterwards. Seeing Billy Zane (laughs) in like his prime and he says this is one of his favorite performances he was allowed to be absolutely unhinged it yeah, was I mean, great he was a, yeah he was allowed to have trust they, they, they trusted him to do mm-hmm. his work and I think that's what he really because I mean all actors really just want to be able to just be free and I think they were like you know what we trust you on this like I don't know what this collector character is so it's whatever you make it Billy yeah. like also I was a huge Roswell fan when I was in high school. So seeing William Sadler, when I saw that he was in this, I was super excited. I I was, it's weird because I don't think I really saw a lot of the movies he was in when he was younger. So to see him so baby faced and I was like, oh. No, no, he, William Sadler. And then, and I don't know if you saw the Demon Knight trailer, but like they made note of like the William Sadler from Die Hard 2, Billy Zane from Dead Calm and Jada Pinkett from Menace to Society. And like, he he said, I love those titles. The Crypt Keeper like was saying they're in this movie, but they're like the big three. But what really stuck out is like, you have Dick Miller, you have an elderly man, you have, but I forget what uh, his name is escaping me, but but the one who played Bob, he's an indigenous actor. He's actually an indigenous actor. And then having CCH Pounder. I see that's the, that's that's, that's it for me. That's it, yeah. CCH Pounder. Yeah. <laughs> Deputy Bob's name is Gary Farmer. Yeah, Gary Farmer. And then we also have Thomas Hayden Church, where I was just like, Sandman. <laughs> like, as soon as it appeared, I'm like, oh, I knew you. <laughs> yeah, and this was when Wings was on. He was in yes. this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was another, oh, Ned and Stacy. I yes. love that show. And I was so sad when they canceled it. That yeah. was early 90s. That was before Will and Grace because mm-hmm. what's her face was, was in it. And it's funny because a lot of these people have had, actually some of them have had career booms since the film. So like even Thomas Hayden Church, like he got nominated for an Oscar nine years after this movie. Yeah. Was it for Sideways? <laughs> yeah, Sideways. Yeah. And I think his name is Ryan O'Donoghue. He, he played Danny, the little boy. Mm-hmm. He did the voice of Randall on Recess. <laughs> Oh. Like, so it's like everybody's everybody was working in this movie random that's random had no idea yeah I, he came on the screen and i was like oh he could be a hansen brother <laughs> <laughs> that's all i thought about i i laughed more than i've laughed in a long time watching this movie i'm not gonna lie i watched it with my sister and it it got it laughter from the jump mm-hmm. <laughs> from I, the beginning yeah I was just like, oh my God. And I didn't know because it's the first time I'm watching it when the movie starts and it has that like, I was too scared to watch Tales from the Crypt when I was little. So I didn't know anything about this like teaser opening situation. So I was like, oh, guess we're starting with 
this woman rolling around in blood in her skivvies and John Larroquette is in it. Like what's happening <laughs> right now? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like the Crypt Keeper is directing the movie. It, it's like, what's happening? Like, <laughs> I, I, I got two minutes in and she says, killing him is almost better than sex. I'm all hot and squishy now. And I text <laughs> message Danielle. I'm like, Danielle, she said she's hot and squishy. I don't know what's going on. And I said, buckle up <laughs> because the one-liners are coming. <laughs> it's only going to get better. I did jump when I was like, why did he, the butcher knife thing when he, mm -hmm. it scared me because I was like, what's happening right now? Oh yeah, when he was cutting the film. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then I'm like, oh, so John Larroquette is not in this movie. This is just some sort of weird trailer thing. Okay. And then when you see William Sadler in his car driving furiously away from Billy Zane's collector character. It, I was like, what what is happening? And you know you don't have gas so why did we take this journey what <laughs> what's happening here and why did you turn your car so that you could be hit directly in it i don't know yeah. decisions yeah. were made <laughs> I, I think when you're in a position where you have the key that will save the all of humanity you might make some crazy decisions i i honestly i don't even think about it like that i think the movie is just immediately trying to get you in this zone of a tone shift yeah. like okay so it's not like because you have to realize that when people go see this movie in the theaters they're expecting a horror film that's how it was marketed it's like a real horror film and then you get that like goofy tongue in the cheek opening yeah it's like okay we gotta we gotta have an explosion i don't know if the car would have exploded that like that but we needed to begin with a bang yeah <laughs> it did <laughs> literally it did. It was giving me supernatural vibes at yes. first because it was like the muscle cars on a like dark road and stuff. Supernatural owes residuals to this film <laughs> because even yeah. like like you just replace Jesus's blood or whatever with salt and we've got a supernatural mm -hmm. episode. 100%. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the writers also did the show called Brimstone. So I actually think maybe... Supernatural is inspired by that show Brimstone. Yeah. It's like six yeah. degrees of demon night. <laughs> yeah. There I actually think there are a lot of influences of demon night in film. It's because it, it's one of those things that I think it's something if you know it, you know mm -hmm. it. Yeah. <laughs> and so like it it it's influential in the weirdest ways. And I will say, like the beginning, there were a lot of one-liners, and I'm like, what's going on here? Like <laughs> Is this a comedy yeah. horror? Like, what's happening here? But then towards the end, I'm like, I haven't, I haven't Laughed written down. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, actually, this is a pretty decent movie once you like get into it. But it was just like easy. It was almost like that transition of like the puns and over the top horror and like slowly transitioning you into like the deep horror genre I, I did not have that same experience no I, I laughed all the way up to maybe like the last at, towards the the death the, then I stopped laughing but yeah it was ridiculous all the way and I loved every minute of it <laughs> but I think I loved it for different reasons yeah because it my sister also heightened the experience because she was just like what the hell is going on mm -hmm. also i did know that you could try to unlock a car with a pocket knife this you man could, has um... lived for centuries and you telling me you like i think the thing that really made me upset about his character was you've lived forever running away from the collect the collector or the mm -hmm. collectors and you haven't had like you've had enough time to make us really sound plan, have some preparation, have like a backpack. What What's going on? You Why got a pocket we... knife and Jesus's blood that, and, and a prayer. <laughs> That's it. Why are we on the run? Why are we just not like in a sound location where like we've just made our, our little 
blood barrier and we just hanging out like yeah and why are they there them? like yeah. why are they in new mexico like what what's happening how did this all, and it's like the strangest what i love about the film though is that it doesn't care like, it's yeah. like <laughs> we're not gonna answer those questions it no. doesn't matter who cares like, we're, we're gonna... here right now in wormwood new mexico <laughs> And it's this like is be what's present. Happening. It's like be present. We are. It doesn't matter. How did you get to New Mexico? Where were you before? Weren't you in another country? You've been running. You just. It's like listen. But like I don't even have the questions about what happened before. I am in the now. Why are you trying to break in the car with a pocket knife? He had break to get glass. out. Oh, uh, I. Why are hanger? I've had a lot of questions about like some of the decisions he does. And I think it's not, we're not, I don't think it's that we're meant to not like him, but I think we're meant to see how it, it does help show how smart Geraldine is. Yes. Later. Mm-hmm. Because she Gerilyn like figures it out like that. Immediately. Like she figures it out in the moment, like mm-hmm. her shift from, she started off incredibly scared yeah. and just and actually trying to run out the house. But going into a, a place of being, I'm gonna fight from. I'm fighting for humanity. Yeah. I'm gonna put this blood in my mouth. I'm gonna do something. Like she saved. Like I had a lot of criticisms of her throughout the whole movie. I'm not gonna yeah. lie, because I'm like, we're making a lot of bad decisions. Fuck this cat. <laughs> First and foremost, okay. It's all she had, Danielle. God damn this cat. Those decisions and. My sister is, she's a petite woman and she's like, I, what I don't like in this movie is the fact that it, let them throw Jada like a rag doll one more time. I said, oh Lord. But she, the way that like the velocity of which she would fly when they <laughs> threw her. And I think it was like her. I don't think it was yeah. like a body double or even like a fake body. I was like, man, the way they throw on this girl on set. Uh, Jada, uh, but I heard it. So I, there's a documentary to tale, to Demon Knight that was on a Blu-ray that I also have. I have <laughs> all of the in the documentary. They they it's like an hour long documentary. It's about the making of the film, and they have all these interviews from people. And Jada is not interviewed, but they do talk about her. Well, I think maybe like she just couldn't do it, but like they were talking about her, and they said, "What was she like on set?" And Brenda Baki, who she played Cordelia. Yeah, she said she would come out. She would be in her trailer, and she would be working out with her trainer, and she would come out to do the scene and film with us, and then go back to her trailer. <laughs> like Jada was in like a superstar mindset, so I was like, maybe Jada was like, push me around, make me an action star. They need to see <laughs> that, that I can do. Because this was like a moment for her. Like this, yeah, was, this was a big. Actually, I think this was a really sought after role for not just. Jada, but just they wanted, actresses. They wanted Cameron Diaz to be in it. Yeah. And I believe the director fought for Jada to have it, which I love. I love that. Yeah. Ernest Dickerson is the director. He, he directed Juice before this. Yes. Um, and, and, like, and, and before the, yeah, in this movie called Surviving the Game, and he was like Spike Lee cinematographer on like mm-hmm. Do the Right Thing, Not yep. Next. And he was incredibly conscious you could tell the decisions are from a black filmmaker there are decisions yeah. that like like not only just having jada but being like we need to have a diverse cast yeah and he fought for jada when the studio wanted cameron diaz would have been i think her I first think breakout she, role yeah yeah well, no like the mask have, was a year i don't think she would, yeah i don't know if she would have been in the mask like i think maybe they were gotcha. conflicting or something but like he fought for jada and you know this was produced by joel silver yeah. Robert Zemeck, Robert Zemeckis, and he fought for Jada got the part, and then right before they were supposed to start shooting, Jada called Ernest Dickerson on the phone and said, "Hey, so I cut my hair. So apparently she had really long hair. You know, when she was in the, yep. the Inkwell, yeah, she had longer hair. And she, so this was filmed in '94. She cut her hair to short and blonde, right? That and so she said, I I did this." I just let I'm just letting you know this is how I want my hair. Right. Joel Silver comes to the <laughs> uh and to the set and sees it. All of these rich, famous white men are on set with Jada. And 
they're like, you have to wear a wig. And she said, I'm not going to wear a wig. This is how my hair is going to be in the film. This is how I want it. So there's this like thing about Jada Pinkett knowing exactly what this role was mm-hmm. for. And I don't know if it gave her exactly what she wanted, but it was meant to show her in a certain light. Because yeah. like right after this, she did The Nutty Professor. <laughs> Where she wore a horrible wig. So I guess she gave into that, but I do love that. I love that she, because if you think about it, we didn't have a lot of roles, first of all, where we are the lead, but Mm -hmm. to be unapologetically like, this is my natural hair. Yep. I'm shaving it off that, you know, I think when I watched it, I didn't even think about from that time period because I'm so used to Jada having haircuts like that in some of her movies and in real life. So yeah, that was very powerful for that time period. Yeah, you still don't see, you really still don't see like a natural hair, a black woman. I'm going to have a really short and blonde. You going to know I'm a black woman in this movie. Mm-hmm, it's like yeah. the strangest thing. I think that's what she was really going for is just looking like right. herself and what yeah. she wants to represent. Because she was walking down the red carpet for this movie, looking exactly like she looked in the char- as a character. So it was her look. Mm-hmm. I think the only other time, and it's been more recently, is when Viola Davis in How to Get Away with Murder, when she did that whole scene where she took her wig off, she yeah. showed, you know, her natural hair, and then, like, after, shortly after that, she just stopped, she stopped trying to wear wigs on red carpets, she's just like, I'm just gonna be myself, and you're just gonna yeah. have to kind of deal with it, so... Yeah, I remember she was she was going through the award season for the help with wigs on, and then mm-hmm. she showed up to the Oscars without the wig, and it was the most, it was like a statement of like, here, yeah. I'm at the biggest, I'm on my biggest platform, I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, she was talking about that, I think recently, and, or maybe it wasn't, but it was on, crap, Anderson Cooper's daytime show, and so she's like talking about being in her truth, and what it was like for her as a black woman wearing her hair naturally and then Anderson Cooper tried to make like kind of a passing joke and then she still like she paused and then continued to like tell her truth and like people were lighting him up because it's just another example of when you tried to be yourself as a black woman and especially white men white people will tried to come in make it a joke when it's a very serious moment and interrupt so I really god I love Viola Davis I can't wait to finally see Woman King yeah and what I loved about what Jada did is she didn't give them a choice she was like listen we're gonna film tomorrow so unless you want to do all that work to get somebody else yeah you're gonna let me be you're gonna let me be myself which they I mean thank god it went that way because yeah they totally could have I could see them being spiteful in that way yeah I and I, I think they wanted to film I, I, from what I remember it, they said Universal had to like see it to approve it and Universal was like it's fine we don't right. care <laughs> 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 it's a movie about demons they're coming to see the demons not her right <laughs> yeah. they might walk away liking her but they're not coming in for her I was glad that even her clothes for most of the movie were baggy like they weren't they were over sexualizing Cordelia which I was Mm -hmm. annoyed by but like they didn't over sexualize Jada till the end I did find her and her tank top and underwear quite unnecessary yeah but I was happy that they didn't try to do like hard nipples situation which always happens in a white tank top situation in a scary movie so yeah and also lose some and there's an interview from a Universal executive saw the movie. Okay, so they had to reshoot the ending. There was an original ending where he turns into like this big demon ball of fire and like starts trying to eat at her. And, you know, something happens and I don't know, I didn't see it, but it, she, she still saves the day, but it becomes, it's actually a lot more violent, more expensive, all of that. The Universal executive saw it and one of them said, why doesn't he just fuck her? Hmm. Like, one of the Universal executives said that, and Ernest Dickerson, I think, got irate and got really <laughs> upset with him. But, like, 
they changed the ending to this one where it was a little bit more like he just turns into a demon and like blows up. I think it was that Universal wanted them to do something that they did not want to do with, yeah. Yeah. Jay, with Jada. And I think that was because Ernest Dickerson was on that set. If he was not on that set, I don't know if this film would have... I think they would have sexualized her more, honestly. Mm-hmm. I think they I, I think they would have yeah, they would have been less interested in her being an action hero. Yes. Yeah. And like the savior and more interested in her being the object at the end, especially with a white man. It's just yeah. I don't think she would have stayed on. No. Yeah, I I think that he fought so hard to get her in the first place. Yeah, she, she might not in. have even made the yeah. cut in the if he wasn't on there. So yeah. Thank God. No, yeah, he, I think he fought for her, and I also think, thank God, they didn't fire him because yeah. he was e- he was a. It's actually really it's easy to replace a director sometimes over even in a star, you know, and they got him staying on because I think he protected all of the actors because yeah. apparently this was a very good set. Everybody was enjoying themselves. It was yeah. not hard. It wasn't a difficult film to shoot. They filmed it in the daytime because they filmed it in the the, one, the what is it the airplane, airplane hangar. Air, yeah, and they mm-hmm. filmed, so they filmed it in the day because Ernest Dickerson said, I'm not going to torture the cast by doing night shoots for months. So we're going to do day shoots, get everybody night's rest. And we're going to just, we're going to do, it. he was protecting them the entire yeah. time in ways they probably didn't even completely realize. Yeah. I, just the whole, <laughs> the whole journey. It was cool because it, when we did 13 Ghosts, I think one of the things that we loved about the movie was that the setting was contained. Same with kind of like with Panic Room as well. So having the boarding house kind of like out no man's land, it's almost like the boarding house became another character for yeah. it. And just seeing very early on, like when Breaker comes in and seeing how all the different characters interact with him and you're immediately getting an idea of who everybody is and what their Mm -hmm. place is jada is very feisty from the jump which i was like damn she knows she's not getting fired apparently yeah which okay there there is nobody else (laughs) yeah (laughs) she can take five hours to clean the oven because there's no one else to do it like what is she cleaning it for why is she cleaning it we don't use it really how many people yeah there not with that guacamole <laughs> ketchup thing that was a choice i was like what is that why what is this what I is loved this it. thing i love that choice i'm like sometimes we need to do absurdity in film it's like what i still don't know what that is i know mm-hmm. it looked like oatmeal mush she and he put it in the little circles and then you oh. want some but that line of like oh hell no like <laughs> <laughs> followed almost immediately by get that pussy off my table (laughs) and then she gets off and then she meant the cat yeah Uh. (laughs) (laughs) and and i if you told me the actors were allowed to improvise all of their lines i'd be like that makes sense (laughs) and but i i love a movie when mm-hmm. you get an esteemed actor, somebody like CCH Pound, a trained, yeah, like like I, because you know I identify with actors. I'm like I've trained. I I love those actors mm-hmm. that actually show their real authentic self and be like, yeah, I say pussy on a movie. Why not? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like get that pussy off. The- that was fun. Like because she's <laughs> because she's not like that in her interviews and like, mm-hmm. but but also you know it's like she, she's it's fun. It's fun yeah. to see people going out of the box of what they normally are in on screen. Yeah, like, sure, I'll play this character that's arm gets ripped off and I have to, and then at the end, I just, like, pull grenade pins and sacrifice myself for the greater good. Right, like, and get my arm ripped off, but I'm running around the whole time. Mm-hmm. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm climbing up ladders with one Yes, <laughs> and I'm like, she's bleeding out. There's no way. And then you're drinking alcohol on top of that. You're bleeding out. What is this? My sister was like, let it go. <laughs> but the way she her had arm, a tourniquet, the way her arm broke off, like that shook me. I had to rewind it because I was like, wait a minute, what just <laughs> happened? It just snapped off like a freaking Lego. 
right up. These de- <laughs> but these demons have a lot of strength. Okay, it's true. That's that's. I mean, they they have strength. They grabbing the people <laughs> and like throwing them all over. That's why Jada is flying against the walls because they're so strong, you know. And um, I don't know. Like it was weird too because it's like if they're so strong, can't they just like break or like punch one of the walls and get in? Or like they don't have to go through the the windows and the doors. They can right. just punch the walls. Right. Through. Does the barrier protect not just like the entrance, but like that entire wall as well? Mm-hmm. That's that was my question, and right. I'm glad they answered why the blood replenished mm-hmm. because we find out later that Breaker has lived for years, and his key it gets passed on after the key holder dies, but apparently the first key had the blood of jesus and then pa- after that each key holder once they sacrifice or die their blood with the mixture of the residue of jesus's mm-hmm. blood continues on thank yeah. god there was an explanation because that would have drove me crazy you know they said they were like okay so we have to come up with a reason for this because people <laughs> are gonna be like how's that little tiny thing feel so much blood and right. what is it doing <laughs> I would have personally, I was like, I think a dropper, like a little dropper would have been a little bit more efficient, a spray bottle. My sister's like, would you shut up about <laughs> yeah, Come on now. <laughs> what is so fun about the film is that it doesn't, it, like it doesn't try to make sense of it at all. They're like, it's no, not. a key is cooler looking than a dropper. We're not going to use a dropper. <laughs> well, no, I mean like you have the key, to but I would have added it? a dropper. Yes. Because yeah. like... When Jada... No, I need to, he need to pour everything. <laughs> Jada, pour, Jada pours out like half the bottle on the I bus. I was like, bitch, that's a heavy it's ass a dr- pour. <laughs> you need one of those things like on cocktail bottles where it's like right. a measured pour yeah. every yeah. time. I also was questioning, like my mind was racing. I was like, I wonder if you dilute it with a little bit of water you got and you make it stretch if that's gonna still work it still has the blood in it the whole premise is there's this collector and we get the whole backstory very late into the movie as to what the hell is going on you're just kind of wondering and there's demons and there's some sort of collector and there's a key and there's flashbacks to crucifixions but you don't know exactly what's going on and so it's essentially when god created heaven and earth there is a darkness and so these demons had seven keys to contain the darkness and then god went and dispersed the keys all over the universe and so for (laughs) millennia the demons have been searching for and collecting the keys they have six of them and this is the seventh and last key they have to collect Right, on Earth. And it's of course it's Earth, right? Of, of all course. Place. <laughs> I love how we center ourselves this way, as if Always. we out of the whole universe would be the the last hope. If that was the case, we would be dead. Right. And, it, and of uh, course, it's always expected to be a white man, but the, of course, a white man got the key. Right. It wasn't anybody else before. It was, I mean, like, yeah, of course, Geraldine gets it, but of course, it was a white man first, right? Right. But, <laughs> I was mad because I'm like, First of all, he didn't know she he was like, You're the last one standing, so it's meant to be. It's fate that you are the key keeper. No, bitch, it's just I'm the only one who didn't die. I don't know. I think that's the rule that the in order for it to happen, there needs to be seven people in a space oh, or something like that. That's how yeah. I took it. So seven people are in a space and that is when he can unleash demons. on them. So like that's why the demons didn't come out until he went in there and so as people more people come in he gets more concerned because he's like oh there wasn't a roach person here mm-hmm. and roach adds up a person and then he, there's a line where he says and then you showed up with the sheriff and that's when it became seven people in there with yeah, him freaking out yeah yeah and that's why i think he killed that first cop by punching him through his head was because he needed seven people but then the like kid showed up later so it was it was very much a numbers game yeah, and I think once, but I but I also think like once the demons are out, yeah, it's they're on, out. it's on, and because they went and killed his parents, so they co- they can kill the community. They're out in the world, yeah. And so you have to end that night because I don't I, like I'm trying to make it deeper than it is, but 
I'm pretty sure. Because I never go too deep in this film. I'm like, listen, a man was chasing another man. And then <laughs> he unleashed some demons on a house, Night of the Living Dead style. And it was about one was the last one and they had to live and survive. Mm-hmm. That's how I took it. But I'm I'm pretty sure like there's some sort of like rules to this whole yes. thing. And I think that's why it's so fun with a rewatch. Because the first time you're watching, you don't even know that that's the, right. what's happening. And then you watch and you realize, oh, okay, the numbers are shifting. <laughs> and I think it, it could have been Irene. It could have been Deputy Bob. Or it could have been Gerilyn. But Gerilyn uh, and Gerilyn was, I, I think there was only, both Black women mm-hmm. were, I'm trying to see what's it was Irene, Gerilyn, because they both, we saw yeah. them refuse. Irene and, and the Gerilyn collector. were the only ones that didn't give in to. Yeah. Well, and, and Deputy Bob sacrificed himself too. So it could probably be implied that he was offered some sort of thing and didn't take it. Yeah. So all three of them were worthy of being the new key keeper. It was just Gerilyn made it to the end. Yeah. Yeah. Irene, that... Can we talk about oof, Cordelia and she just Wally. wanted to be loved? No, it's no Cordelia and Roach. Roach and their sexapades <laughs> and what? What was that a jumper cable? It was, yes, it was a nipples? jumper cable. On, it was a jumper cable on the nipples. <laughs> yes, <laughs> attached to a car battery. Tuning um, him up. No judgment to whatever any floats anybody's kink, but is it a little bit dangerous, though? It was not only dangerous to him; it was dangerous to her and the house. Yes, <laughs> especially being on like a bedspread where one little spark, <laughs> whole thing's going up. <laughs> and you and know they she have kissed. no idea. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, like her sheets are very okay. Can we talk? It's just very guacamole. little things that I'm like. Yeah. So she had guacamole stains. <laughs> that was the other thing. I mean, Cordelia was down for it sounded like anything. Yeah. Which appreciated. And even when Breaker shows up, she's like, You down you clown? Go yeah, yeah. Like, can I help you out? Can I service <laughs> you? She took her job seriously and it sounded like she was good at it. But there were definitely moments where you're like, huh? What would you say? What would you doing in that bedroom? <laughs> the deputy when he busts in, the fact that he looked a little bit frightened <laughs> when he caught them, and then was like, "Put your clothes on." <laughs> I <laughs> mean, who wouldn't look though? Like, I would see what you're doing. I, what are y'all doing? Like, what's happening? I feel uh, like I would need another look just to make sure my brain saw what I thought it saw. <laughs> I'm like, it's wait like, a minute, wait a minute. Like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> okay. What, yeah, was, the, like, what was the guy's name that was obsessed with Cordelia? Wally. Wally. And okay. he's Roger Rabbit's voice. That is Roger Rabbit. What? <laughs> that is Charles Fleischer, the voice of Roger Rabbit. Oh my God. He, okay. So when Cordelia is like asking for her sheets. So I guess that is Jalen's job, Mark. And she's like, can you put them on my bed? And she's, she's like, no, I'm busy. And Wally's like, I, I can do it for you. I can get your sheets. I'm like, why can't Cordelia get her own sheets? What is going on here? I think they were implying that, you know, like a hotel like has made that Irene is trying to make her <laughs> the maid <laughs> and she just refuses to be the maid. It's yeah. a boarding house, <laughs> yeah. not a hotel. We don't have maids. <laughs> we That is your room. You take care of your room. <laughs> right. Well, even when Breaker shows up, she's like, take him to room five and, and, Geraldine's like, well, I'll stop cleaning the oven and take your ass upstairs. <laughs> like, on a she's bellhop like, now yeah. as well. She had multiple talents, apparently, yeah. or titles. Uh, <laughs> I love but little things like that. You know, the actor had to come up with some idea in their own head. And they had like, an, even if it's not clear to the audience, they had something specific they were yes. doing. And I know, I know for a fact, CCH Pounder was like, I'm treating this girl like she's my niece. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm telling her what to do as if she's the help. And the audience is going to be confused the entire time on if she actually is supposed to be the help or not. Right. I, I loved that they made her the, the, like she, there was this moment where it's like, that's not really my job. I don't do that here. Right. Yeah. I can clean your stove, but I'm not going to go in people's rooms and put their sheets on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I was confused. I was like, is she related? Are they family? Do they own it together? Is she the help? Why is she complaining if she is the help? Like, I was... Well, I have a novelization. I I have a novelization of the film that (laughs) that I think was based off of an original script. Like, not the one they used, but one of the earlier drafts. And in it, she was her she was her niece and that is why she was there with her they never say that in the film so it's not clear well in the film doesn't she say she's essentially on probation and that's why she's at the boarding house and she's kind of like working off like if this is her like community service is like helping out is what i understood it to be yeah but then it's such a like why is she it's like such a small town yeah. why was she there and then it's kind of like well is, is she related to her and she's working at her that's her customer service to work for her aunt right like, yeah. but it's like it's not clear and but then it's like no nah, i like the idea of two black women that are not related in a movie together like this yeah, yeah. Kind of fun. also when the collector comes and has the sheriff and the deputy or whatnot and they've now cornered breaker then that's when he's like oh you stole something from me and uncle willie is so quick to snitch so it's under quick the table. so right yeah. he's like first oh of, first of all breaker how were you trying to slyly that thing is pretty big like how are you right? slyly trying to put that under the table again i'm like where's your backpack <laughs> maybe he thought he had a rapport with uncle willie (laughs) and that he wouldn't snitch on him and uncle willie was the first one to do it (laughs) Uh, uncle willie had i know where it is (laughs) uncle willie had a ton of crimes during this movie Mm -hmm. he was not loyal very much a snitch and gave it up for a bunch of poom poom that didn't exist real quick (laughs) real quick and booze and booze boobs and booze yeah <laughs> yeah the, t- the temptations of uncle willie <laughs> and he's still trying to get drunk while the house of horrors is happening yeah yeah maybe have a clear and mind d- willie and he didn't help he didn't do anything no. he, he was just <laughs> in the house with them but i'm like that is so realistic for an older person <laughs> sometimes like a really they're gonna just be there they're not gonna help they're gonna be like save me right <laughs> Yeah. So he gave in to his temptations pretty quickly because after finally it's exposed that the collector is no good because he punches a hole right through the sheriff and he gets kicked out. Why? Like, <laughs> there were so many moments where people were just standing there, like, what's going on? <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I, I why, love this. why did. <laughs> breaker as soon as he walked into that establishment start pouring out blood right. at all entrance points like let's seal this shit up we just gotta last till dawn yeah i guess because he was already inside right <laughs> i mean he was too busy eating guacamole and ketchup like <laughs> And tell it and then watch a pussy get off the table. Yeah. yeah or maybe exactly. maybe the blood maybe the no, the blood is activated already. I don't know. I was about to say maybe the blood doesn't get activated, but then Jada had the blood for the bus. But maybe yeah. there were seven people on the bus. So <laughs> Yeah. So it don't make sense, but it don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Just a wondering wonderment. Yeah. <laughs> when he has his devil, his demon babies rise up from the puddles of mud outside. I was like, that's when I really was like, what? What is happening? And he kissed one. (laughs) (laughs) So. Like like my babies. (laughs) So glad you're here. Those things are so gross. I was like, ugh. So my husband hates horror movies. And I'm like, I think you'll be okay with this because I think it's like cartoony enough where it's like, 
Although after watching, I'm like, he would have absolutely had nightmares. I'm so glad that I, we watched Thor Love and Thunder last night and not Demon Knight. So I played the trailer for it. Like, this is what it's going to be. And I paused it (laughs) at that shot where Billy Zane is actively kissing a slimy demon baby. And Kev was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) <laughs> it's like just just play and pause again i just need it off of, i need it off of the scene i'm like i'm really sorry i don't know what's happening right <laughs> i will have to give it up that considering the time period the special effects were pretty damn good yeah. considering i yeah, was they, not they i was impressed they haven't really aged they not in a way where it, it stands out but like there was just people it was really tall, skinny people. The demons yeah. are just really tall, thin people on stilts and yeah. like these, like these, like walking stilts. Yeah, and, it's very... it, and and they like painted their actual bodies. Their bodies are actually painted, so it's way better than even some CGI would have been at the time. So they, they, practical. All yeah, the way. I I I really like the practical effects, even when it was like their blood and stuff. It was just the insides of glow sticks. So like the practical effects were great i think the only thing that took me out of the movie was when they would like destroy their eyeballs in that green cgi <laughs> bolt like that's the only thing because i feel like that's pretty much the only thing that was cgi'd in it i do yeah. love when like first of all we learned that in order to kill them you have to go for their eyes but I do love at one point when a, a pair of eyes like flew out and just were like almost crawling on their own. Yeah. That 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 had me dying. Completely. And then he had to shoot the actual eyes. Yeah. That was that was right after CCH got her arm ripped off. <laughs> okay. Let and we we're all over the place anyways, but like, that scene. Let's talk about yeah. it. Because okay. why? And when I say why. Yes, the- the the whole okay so at this point cordelia has given herself up to the devil mm-hmm. we all right we get it she's easy she's the first to succumb now when she goes to attack breaker again ill equipped not ready for it and all these people in the hallway have weapons or can help and why did irene not shoot the goddamn gun I, I know the answer <laughs> I'm, I'm, because I know for a fact, let me tell you this. We watch horror movies all the time but in, in like movies where like black people make terrible decisions. I saw this thing about, it was Species and it was Esther Scott did an interview and she said, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a scene where she like goes inside Michelle, a young Michelle Williams is on a train. She's a kid. So she keeps checking up on her. She's Esther Scott is playing the conductor. She keeps checking on her. And then at some point she goes in and like, there's this monster thing in there and she keeps going inside. And she said, she said to the director, a black woman wouldn't do that. Right. And they Whenever. made her do it anyway. And I get this feeling, CCH Pounder said, listen, <laughs> it's not realistic for us to try to save this man we just met. Yeah. And we're actually terrified right now. We're going to stay backed up. And I actually think they got her arm ripped off because... <laughs> My theory is her arm is ripped off because she gets the key and like tries to help. The mm-hmm. moment that woman tries to help is it's when the she gets messed. She's yeah. punished. Right. It's like you should have just not helped him. There was a lot of decisions <laughs> that I was like, black women never. First of all, the standing around and like what's going on, the looking for the cat. I, I just feel like they would have gone into action and they would they probably would have dipped at some point. I just. I don't. Well, know. I feel like I feel like they, the film sets it up like the house is in the middle. It what actually is kind of scary watching the film is realizing that if they get out of the house, where are they going? Yeah. Right. And I think they were in that position of just being like, you know, we actually really are stuck here. Yeah. Because, in fact, I mean, honestly, be like, black women wouldn't live here in this <laughs> area. <laughs> That like, is a why fact. Are we, first of all, there's like, how many black women in New Mexico? We're not going to live in this part of New Mexico. No. <laughs> we need others. We need civilization around. And I think, I don't know. I just made up this story in my own mind. That's like, 
this is what happens when you do not live authentically <laughs> to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to go out to New Mexico. And I'm going to have a, you, um, you're living really good, Irene, but look what happened. Mm-hmm. The way that her arm came off clean like a chicken bone was <laughs> nothing I had experienced. I told you I had to pause it and rewind because I was, my mind was <laughs> alone did it, i didn't see it come i i can say that it, that the surprises really got me there well i i love that there there's it's just like okay these demons got some strength because they can just rip your arm there's nothing mm-hmm. you are not safe at all the only thing that protects you is that key like <laughs> well the way that irene was like she was she showed some pain when they were wrapping up her mm-hmm. arm or whatever and they talked about her bleeding out and she drank some of the vodka. They poured some of the vodka for infection on her arm. But like after that, it was almost like she had a little mosquito bite and she had to go about <laughs> her life. I was, the vodka was kicking in. She told him she was fine. But, but did you hear that line though, right before that? He says, at least we're all in one piece. <laughs> Sorry about that, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Vodka's when, kicking in. Like, when I'm the too co- drunk to know how it's- <laughs> I'm fine. You can't insult me. <laughs> Choose your words. Right. <laughs> and then we're good. <laughs> can we can we talk about the collector? Like, so he's going to everybody trying to offer things. But when he pulls up to Irene <laughs> and he's got her and her arm looks so fucked up. Her arm on a platter, like a like platter a, of, of lettuce. And like, it looked it was, like a Thanksgiving turkey, <laughs> but just Irene's arm. He was wrong for that one. I was dying. Well, and then she she takes her little nubby and she like flicks it up. He's like, we got a deal. She's like, no, that's flip me flipping you off. I was like, you still got some sass, but that yeah. probably hurt a lot putting oh, your nubby in she, she literally did it like that. Yeah. But, what, but my question was, your other arm is there. Why not flick him off with that one? Just She's to rub it in his point. face. <laughs> yeah. Just to rub. I don't need that. I can still do it with this arm. I can still do it. But you have to imagine, like, what is going through their minds? They're like, you know what we should do? <laughs> we should put the arm... Like they made these decisions on set. That is not written. They were like, we're going to put the arm on a platter. Like they made these decisions in the moment. Um, and Billy, Billy Zane is going to serve it to her. And yeah. she, and it, and it's so wild because like the first time you see it, you may not notice it or you do notice it, but then you, you start getting all these other, I, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> he, Billy Zane. I I will say this is my favorite role that he's ever that I've ever seen him in and he was fantastic I don't know if you've ever watched Charmed but when he was on Charmed I could feel like he kind of was the fun and just like freedom of that of this character I feel like he kind of brought that a little bit to Charmed because when I was watching it because I seen Charmed first I was like oh this feels kind of familiar more unhinged but the joy that was coming through i don't know yeah and, and commitment like he yeah a hundred percent like we know that this movie is like you could people really like it but we know it's a b movie we know mm-hmm. at this point when he was making this film he was committed because he didn't know where it was going to go or what it was going to be like yeah. he was like this could this could be a a series for me for all i know like it could go anywhere right it was a big studio film so i think he was like let me commit to this and i love that about billy Zane because he takes that opportunity to try to commit at all times but this one was most fun for him i think <laughs> yeah um and jackie's scene behind <laughs> behind the uh the, the picture behind her man when I was doing the notes, I saw that it said that he came up with putting the sponge in his mouth. So so I, I read that before it came up and it didn't make sense to me because obviously I hadn't seen the movie. So when he did it, I had to pause again and I was on the floor dying because it is perfection. Cinematic perfection. <laughs> like, just it- like, I need you to wipe that blood barrier up for me. <laughs> like, it's just... <laughs> Like, I don't know what just happened, but I'm in. And I'm kind of glad that Roach is a scumbag and is willing to, like, give up the key so easily. 
Yeah, huh? no. And, and this simple line of, hey, Roach, I lied. And yeah. then just having the, <laughs> like, like, I'm so glad you are the only one that didn't know I was lying. Like, it's so aware of the audience, too. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, like, the audience is going to think you're dumb right now. So I'm just, I lied. <laughs> Thomas Hayden Church is so good at playing an asshole. It is like yes. his brand. And I want to say it's one of his earliest roles of of kind of diving into that. Yeah. He when when the demons originally come and he's like, I'm I'm booking it out of here. And he tells yeah. Cordelia, <laughs> like, you should come with me or whatever. He's like, I'm going. And when he goes out and he's like, he gets caught up, and then Cordelia's dumbass gets <laughs> He pushed her out. He's like, he, did. he had the audacity when after like she gets saved, he's like, ain't nobody told you to go out there. But you did, and you pushed me. You shoved me outside. Well, you know, I think what his character kind of represents is why, like, for example, why CCH, like, why Geraldine and, and Irene don't try to leave because mm -hmm. he does all the dumb decisions right. yes. and tells them like okay like he's like I'm about to run out and then they see okay so that's not an option we can't mm -hmm. do that because <laughs> yeah because his yeah he did it for us and then he literally takes the the sponge and cleans it up like he ruins it for everybody he yes. lets them upstairs yeah he shoots at at Homer <laughs> the undead Homer, because he paid him under minimum wage, breaks the barrier, oh, lets Jesus. the demons into the house. Like, Roach is always fucking up, which I will say, Sean Whalen and people under the stairs, far superior Roach than Hayden Christians, uh, Hayden <laughs> Thomas Hayden, Church's. Thomas Hayden Church, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thomas Hayden Church's Roach in this movie. Just I, saying. I do <laughs> like, though, that in a normal I guess a typical horror movie his character might have actually been the anti-hero or yeah. been the one that makes it or survives even though maybe they start off selfish or whatever mm -hmm. so I do appreciate that he took on that role his character did and I also appreciate that normally those dumb decisions they give to a female um, mm -hmm. character to do and so i i was happy to watch him die a hundred percent how's it going everybody this is chewy and this is monica and we are from the podcast titled exploring the myths behind the legends <laughs> where we talk about stuff like horror films shows and folk legends you can find us on anchor spotify apple Podcasts, and podchaser like us and give us a review Cordelia, the thing is, he he tempts her with her emotions, not just like she's not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she makes a dumb decision, but it it's a little bit has a little bit more depth to it than yeah. anyone else's. Like Willie got a drink and a kid got a comic book, <laughs> 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 and he didn't have to give Roach anything. He was just like Roach, I'll let you walk home. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, just just insanity. I do love that Irene sacrifices herself and with the deputy, they're like mm -hmm. ride or die. And the way in which she like tears through the- The pins of the grenade. Yeah, I, I was like, well, hate to see you you're go, go, but you're going out in a blaze of glory and I love that. Thank you, thank you, you yes. say great us. Like, <laughs> we had, see what happens when you have two black women, you can kill one because yeah. we, it's like and what i also love my friend actually pointed this out to me a few years ago he was like there was two black women and neither of them were killed mm -hmm. yes yeah, she One chose died. it for herself yeah yeah none of the demons did not get them yep love that yeah yeah let's talk about danny's <laughs> demise towards the end of the movie so they're up in the attic the and, and Uncle Uncle Willie, no, it's after Uncle Willie. Uncle Willie is killed. Yeah, it's just him and Geraldine left. Yeah, yes. And the collector talks to him through the Tales from the Crypt comic book. It was so meta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Danny gives into temptation because he's like, 
10 and starts attacking. What was the unhinged, comically long jaw tongue situation that Danny turned into? And why was he licking the wound he made in Breaker's stomach? He, well, because he's a demon now, and they don't they want to eat him? Do they the eat animal? him? Uh, yeah, they eat them. They okay. Actually, they, in the film, Got I it. think it's okay. consistent that they, when Gerilyn went in the room, they were eating his That's wound. right. So there's something about consuming, you know, make it deep or something. It's about <laughs> consuming <laughs> the collector so that you can get, I don't know. But... <laughs> That, I mean, I looked on tvtropes.com once and I was looking at this film and it said, this is an example of nightmare fuel. He is the <laughs> youngest and actually has the most grotesque demon in the entire yes. film. They went there. <laughs> they <laughs> went there. Yeah, they went, because like, I guess if you're talking about rules of horror, usually you don't, you don't kids. kill the young yeah. kids. So when he came up again, because like obviously we saw him in the beginning, and then when we find him and his parents are all demonized, I'm like, oh, so they gotta, it's gonna end up being like Jada and this kid, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tales from the Crypt said, nah, no and kids no, allowed. They, they were playing with horror movie conventions. I'm yeah. telling you, it was an intentional idea. They were like, we're gonna make you think the black woman is gonna die mm -hmm. first. We're gonna bring a kid in because you're gonna think this kid is gonna like live eventually it's like it's the weirdest especially decision. because they do give danny moments where he is a savior character like he thinks yeah. quick he like shoves Un uncle willie's eyeballs onto the antler like he doesn't hesitate in any way he's down to help and then all of a sudden at the end he just gives into that goddamn collector and they put him in that like the red like hoodie that they always mm -hmm. give the kids in the movies that save everything. It's very last yes. action hero. <laughs> I love that movie so much. <laughs> right. It's like, but they were like, you think this is going to be like mm -hmm. those kind of movies where the kid is like, no. Yeah. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to make it even worse than anything yeah. else in this movie. More like disturbing looking. Yeah. Oh, it was. And it then, was a look. <laughs> and then at that point, now, like, you know, Breaker's like, look, Geraldine, Ger yeah, Geraldine, Geraldine, it's you. Geraldine, yeah. it's you. Yeah. And, and he knows that he's dying. So he refills the key and then he presses it into her hand. Which Does he refill it? Because doesn't she go back and get it? Like, well, what... because she had to drink it all. To yeah, she was, it there's there's a shot re... of her filling it again. And yeah, then, so goes, I didn't. I missed the part where he filled it. That's I, I was asking my sister. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. did he fill it up for her? Because I, I missed it. He okay. did. Yeah, he filled it up and then like pressed it in her hand, and that's when it marks the new key keeper. Yeah, with the stars on it, and so. But she's like, "I'm a final girl. Let's do this." So now it's just kind of a cat and mouse with her and the collector, and <laughs> she first covers herself in the blood there like for her to have enough blood to completely cover herself right. head to toe and then still have enough to get a good mouthful of it sucks well what about this she had on white and she was blood soaked and then after he rinsed it off it was white yes <laughs> yeah like was there bleach but one key scene that we we need to talk about is as soon as he realized that she is drenched in the blood and that like he she like shocks him or whatever mm -hmm. happens to him the way he dove into that like opening I guess they're in the attic the way he just mm -hmm. dove down there like he was going into a pool another moment where I had to pause and I died <laughs> laughing because it just again I was like wait a minute <laughs> well, when he gets into that room he just floats up <laughs> like here he's, I am. He's like a Looney Tunes character. Yeah. He has like thing, or like if you remember in like cartoons where they'll reach in their pocket and pull out a whole piece of paper. Like yes. they do that. Like it's a very like like Warner Brothers cartoon yeah. trope. Yeah. And and then he does finally catch catches Gerilyn off guard and strong arms her into a now there's a bathtub and he is mm -hmm. bathing the hell out of her and then mm -hmm. We get this miraculous white outfit and her tank top and underwear. And Which then he I starts will say, well, I will say, like, 
it was pretty smart of him to take the shower curtain because he knew he couldn't touch her. Like right. I did like that touch. And then he still had her in it and she was thumping down those stairs. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> like, it was like, down the like... <laughs> <laughs> then again, just Zanny antics by the collector. Mm. He's like, we going to dance now. And I knew that at this point that Gerilyn had something in her mouth mm-hmm. because she's not saying anything, but the dance. And then, like, the light shift, like, it becomes a theatrical <laughs> experience. <laughs> it reminds me of the dream sequence in Look Who's Talking Now between Kirstie Alley and John Travolta where it's like you know yeah. they're in a like weird dream thing and they know it, like it's a very breaking a fourth wall without breaking a fourth wall and everyone's just sitting there confused <laughs> yeah they did that a lot in the look who's talking films in general I think yeah where yeah. they where they were like just draw attention out of the movie with like something ridiculous yeah or like the dancing with, with John Travolta with the kids, but <laughs> but where they like go around the baby gym. Yes. Um, but I think this film does that in other parts too. It it pulls out like like the Uncle Willie scene. It's like okay, at this point we are all in on that Uncle Willie is being tricked. Yeah. And we're just seeing how <laughs> dumb he is. Like we not they are not trying to fool us at all. I love that the film points out how dumb these characters are. <laughs> And I love where they show the kid's perspective. And he's just like, Willie, what's she doing? Like, right. <laughs> what you seeing that I'm not seeing? And you right. know, I, I have to say, 90s porn or Skinamax that I would definitely sneak to watch. It's not real hardcore porn, but it had it had an aesthetic to it. It and did. This yeah. movie very much captures that moment. And I was like, oh, I remember those days. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it was it was the color of the bras. Yes. I mean, like when they, no, like, so the, the color of the bras on Skinamax matched like the lighting scheme of yes. this. I mean, they didn't, have, they didn't have bras on here. But like, <laughs> there was like this, like, it's like blue, green, like, and then like the cocktails. It's something very... Like, it it's just very had that air. Cheesy. Yeah. It was cheesy. And then a lot of the women were sex workers they were on camera sex workers at the time some of them i know chasey lane was one of them so she knew exactly she was like oh you want me to do what i do (laughs) in a major movie cool like that this is her first movie isn't like her first yeah it was her debut yeah yeah Yeah. there were yeah and i think there were some of them then there were some that there's one who is like famous now on reality shows Oh. The, the black one she's on like so many reality shows and little parts and i was like i, I saw her and i was like you're that one from <laughs> deep <laughs> night <laughs> oh my god no but uh, I, I i you know that, and then i guess we can get to that but like now i'm thinking of the fact that at the end the crypt keeper had those two <laughs> women with yes. them <laughs> and they credit them and this they said not one line really <laughs> yes but Crypt Keeper Starlet was what their name. <laughs> the, the others were the party babes. <laughs> I want that on my tombstone. Crypt. Party babe? No, I was Crypt, Crypt oh. Keeper. Starlet? Yes. Thank you. Here That's lies my... Danielle, Crypt Keeper Starlet. Love it. <laughs> and they show up to the premiere for the film at the Fox Theater in L.A. <laughs> it's a real that's a real place that they were premiering demon they're premiering tales from the crypt demon night in the movie yes again you can you can read the title <laughs> demon <Night. laughs> everything there's a lot of meta and a you lot know, of meta and it's me- and i don't know how many other horror movies were as meta like i we got that in scream obviously mm-hmm. but I don't recall like a whole bunch of movies previously kind of no. playing at themselves in that same way. Yeah. So I thought that and was kind of cool. No, like I, I'm, you're not, it, I don't think there's too many horror films that do that. And I also think what's funny about this film is that it's taking on the form of like, we're watching the Crypt Keepers movie, right? Yeah. So, so in the movie, the Crypt Keeper cast Jada Pinkett to play like they're actually 
that's the whole point. And so the trailer takes on the form of the Crypt Keeper telling us about his new movie coming out yes. called Beam and Night, and he cast Jada Pinkett. So it's weird. And then, like, <laughs> when the movie starts, we get the little number call down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it zooms in on the screen. They're like, you're watching a movie right now, a fake yeah. movie in a fake movie. Um, there are layers. <laughs> yeah. And I think we kind of talked about, like, you know, Breaker being cast, like Breaker being the savior, and then it shifts. But with this movie, it was passed on. It had multiple people's hands on it before it got made with, you know, Joel Silver and the cast that we got and the director we got. But one person proposed, I like the film was going to cast an all American, not all American, they were going to cast an African American actor for the role of Breaker. So that it created a theme that suggested that the oppressed people of Earth were also the redeemers. I would have loved to see it. Yeah, that would have yeah. been really cool. But yeah, and um, I think and maybe aspect of that actually stayed in it though with the yeah. Geraldine because yeah. Geraldine wasn't written to be black at all. Like I, I think I don't even know. I think this is an example of when something gets passed around a lot everybody's ideas kind of come together and it mm-hmm. allows like more freedom in the actual process because I don't know if they would have been comfortable with a black woman in the role of Geraldine if they hadn't already been thinking about race with the story anyway. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. obvious. Go ahead. Oh, well, we just have to, or were you going to end the movie? Or yeah. I was going to okay. just say, <laughs> um, uh, obviously she has some of the blood in her mouth. She spits it at the collector. He was well, not. Well, first ex- she stabs him in the eye. Yes. And then he's like, oh, Breaker didn't tell you the rules. And then she spits out the blood and mm-hmm. got him. So he like burns and shrivels up and dies. And uh, then afterwards we see her getting on a bus, leaving. And she's smart enough to put a little bit of blood on the bus at the entrance so that nobody else, you know, no demon can get on top of her. And again, I already see a difference, a shift in the smart thinking in comparison to all the nonsense mm-hmm. Breaker was doing. He didn't so. do anything. <laughs> he just he just ran away and poured some out. That's it. Yeah. So love that. Love that she, you know, she's the 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 last survivor. We also do get a scene where there now is a black collector, mm-hmm. and he can't get on the bus, but he's like, "I'm gonna wait for the next one." I'm like, he's pretty cool. He looked like a little cowboy. I do. <laughs> I did want to yeah. see that sequel with them facing off with each other. And as he's walking away, he starts whistling the Tales from the Crypt theme. Yep. And yeah, and it it was a perfect setup for like a real true like black horror yes. movie, like a, yes. like a black one. It was like Ernest Dickerson was like, I'm gonna throw this in there. Honestly, that could have they probably could have even cut that out of the movie. Yeah. We know she won. We didn't have yeah. to see she was gonna be chased again by the. I don't know. I just feel like that is something. Ernest Dickerson had to be like, nah, we get in a black one. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah, like like you said, even with Billy Zane, just trying to think what possibilities we didn't, they didn't know if the movie was going to be big or not. You see over the course of the millennia during flashbacks, they've killed four of the seven collectors. So they, they could have done sequels because we had three more before we like right. entirely saved the universe, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe this this podcast will get people to think and start asking. <laughs> I'm I'm lying. I can't Twitter even petition. <laughs> Listen, nice Ernest Dickerson. I need you to get with Jada Pinkett and just mm-hmm. do another one. But you yeah. can. And they can have a better budget, better script. It'll Thirty be... years later, yeah. She's Listen, still if they could get, they got sequels to Tales from the Hood now, and that made Facts. a lot less money than this. Facts, facts, facts. Gosh, can't wait to. We have to do one of those movies. <laughs> that I, 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 I am actually excited to do Bones when we get there. But Bones. all in all, this is Demon Night. We did it, y'all. We, we did it. Here we, we are. Did it. We did it. Before we get into our today ratings, Amar, why don't you tell everybody your social handles so they can find you and check out your videos? 
I am at the Anwar Ali on TikTok and Instagram. So it's the same, the Anwar Ali. <laughs> and <laughs> don't forget, you guys can always give us feedback, questions, hot takes. If you think we messed something up, you can hit us up on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, or YouTube at No More Late Fees. And I'm going to start with you, Anwar. What was your rating? I would buy it again. I love the movie. <laughs> I already have so many copies of it. I have to buy it anyway. <laughs> it's probably gonna have good special features <laughs> on it. <laughs> Jackie, now that you've seen the movie, what's your rating? I'm gonna give it a five day. What? Because I think this is a really fun movie to sit and watch with people who have never seen it Best. and just watch reactions. <laughs> like I won't even watch the movie. I'll just be like, <laughs> what's gonna happen? That's literally what I do. That's part of it. Like, <laughs> you gotta watch it with me. <laughs> oh gosh. I'm not, I, you guys know, I'm not a horror person. I know. It's okay. And <laughs> I, again, laugh my ass off, but am I gonna watch it again? Pro no. That, no, I'm not. I, I'm not. So I'm gonna go, I'm sorry with the two day rental. Because it's not horrible because I laugh so hard, but I know I'm not watching it again. But that goes no, for most you of You might the tell movies. somebody to watch it, though. I will. <laughs> I, I'm telling people to watch it right now because as much as you've listened to this episode, it ain't. It didn't what, do it justice. Like. You gotta watch it. You gotta watch it. 100%. Please watch it and tell us what you think. It's Again, it's on Peacock. It's also for rent on Amazon. I, I can't, I want to know what you think. And if you watched it back in the 90s and you haven't seen it in a while, this is your time for a rewatch because it didn't age badly. Well, I know this movie has some really hot takes. So if you'd like to get in on the hot take action, head, call in to our quick drop, 909-601-NMLF. 909-601-6653. Twat us up the Twitters or leave a voice message on our Anchor FM account and you can be featured on a future episode. Thank you for joining oh us. Gosh. How was it? Did you have fun? Did you enjoy it? I, I love yeah. your passion for this movie. Yeah, I know. I have fun. I love to draw. So, <laughs> especially about this movie. So it came so naturally and easily. Thank you for letting me do this. It was fun. Oh, thank yeah. you for joining us. And join us next week as we find love in a horror place with Valentine. And as always, be kind and rewind. <laughs>